Hi, good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. I am Paulo Souza, uh, adjunct professor at Sea Sciences Institute, Labomar. Welcome to the third Fortaleza's Austro Spring School. So session four, conservation and management. So uh, I'd like to invite Professor Federica Constantini. Federica is Associated Professor at the Department of Biological, Geological and Environmental Sciences, Ravenna Campus, University of Bologna, Italy. She has a PhD in Enver Environmental Science. Her scientific interest is related to the use of generic and genomic approaches for biodiversity conservation and sustainable management of marine benthic populations and communities. Specifically, she is interested in one, to evaluate how anthropogenic impacts alter the genetic makeup of the populations. Two, to identify common barriers to gene flow for biodiversity conservation. And three, to identify management and conservation units in harvested species. She works in a variety of marine coastal environments, including shallow and deep rocky shores, submarine caves, marine urban habitats, artificial coastal and offshore structures, and she uses innovative genetic and genomic tools. Federica. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good to talk. Okay. I'm waiting. Okay. No? First? Okay. Go ahead. Next. In 1992, a shipping container filled with bad toys was lost in the Pacific Ocean. But some of the yellow ducks are still washing ashore today, and some of them have made an incredible journey around the globe, driven by marine currents. We could name these as structural connectivity. Structural connectivity quantifies the physical relationship of landscape elements, including spatial positioning of habitat, geomorphological features of the sea floor, and hydronomic flow impacting movement. Next. <laughs> but the yellow duck lost at the sea were plastic ducks. Organisms respond to environmental heterogeneity and structuring, encompassing their movement and exchanges between habitat patches. This is functional connectivity. Functional connectivity is a product of the organism interacting with the landscape. It concerns the patterns and rates of dispersal that result from the response of individuals to the structural metrics mediated by behavioral traits and dispersal success. Next. Describing the dispersive strategies of benthic marine organisms is particularly challenging because of the limited access to the marine environment, their small size, and their large population size. As a result, a diversity of methods and tools like telemetry, genetics, biophysical modeling have been developed from a range of disciplines to predict, reconstruct, or directly track this flow. Genetic connectivity, no. Genetic connectivity tracks the dispersal of genes and genomes, which only account for those individuals that successfully reproduce after dispersing. Next. In 2016, Selkoe and colleagues showed that the vast majority of the studies on genetic connectivity focus on chordates and invertebrates. Althus escape genetic study have occurred in most of the world's major oceans and seas, a bias exists toward the northern hemisphere, and underrepresented regions, like, for example, the southern part of the Atlantic Ocean, still remain. Next. In 2018, we used linear regression models and meta-analytical approach to assess the contribution of genetic markers, phylum, pelagic larval duration, and geographical distance to the population genetic structure of certain marine invertebrates living on coral regions. In the Mediterranean, no, no, in the Mediterranean Sea, coral regions reef are hard substrata for biogenic origin that is mainly produced by the accumulation of calcareous and crusting coralline algae. Coralligenous reefs are biodiversity hotspots and are classified as sensitive habitats deserving conservation. 
Our study showed that among the roughly 300 species of benthic marine invertebrates living on coralliginous, genetic diversity and structure have been investigated for less than 30 species. Most of the species are sponges, cnidarians, echinoderms, and tunicates, while there are no studies on bryozoa and polychaetes, despite their importance as bioconstructors. Our quantitative approach highlights also that the most species show a high significant genetic structuring, and structuring differ between phyla, and pelagic larval duration does not appear to be a major driver of the structuring. Indeed, other biological traits like larval swimming ability and reproduction timing, demographic parameters and recruitment success may shape the population genetic structure observed. Next. So why is it important to study connectivity? Improved knowledge on functional connectivity is a crucial step to understand dynamic ecosystem level changes to promote species and habitat resilience to global change and to manage and conserve marine biodiversity that is nowadays threatened by several human pressure, such as habitat degradation, marine invasion, ocean acidification, warming, disease, and over-exploitation. Next. Current global initiatives for sustainable development, such as the Strategic Plan for Biodiversity 2011-2020 and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal for 2030, number 14, Life Below Water, all require a comprehensive understanding of marine functional connectivity and its drivers in order to anticipate environmental changes and their socio-ecological consequences. Marine functional connectivity knowledge is mandatory for making decisions about where, when, and how to protect marine communities. Indeed, accurate marine functional connectivity knowledge is needed not only to conserve vulnerable species or ecosystem, control the spread of invasive species, pathogens, or aquaculture escapes, to the, but also to determine network of protected areas and to ensure sustainable fishery management. Finally, it is useful to enhance the benefit derived from biodiversity and ecosystem services. Next. In the next slide, I will start to show you um, the main studies that we have carried out based on connectivity in, the, in our research group. So in the last year, we have seen a global sprawl of marine art uh, infrastructure, like for example, black waters, sea walls, or jetties. All these structures can extensively modify. Uh, this structure can extensively modify the the coastal seascape. Moreover, where coastal transformation is not ubiquitous, cluster or artificial structure, structures can serve as corridors that facilitate species invasion and alter ecological connectivity, with a significant effect on marine assemblages. Nevertheless, despite long recognition of the impact artificial structures may have on population genetics, relatively few st studies have even investigated their impact at this level of biological organization. Next. In the Adriatic Sea, there are a lot of artificial structures like barriers to protect the coast and a lot of oil offshore platforms. Them could modify the structure of native sub bottom assemblages and provide new colonizing substrata and generate novel ecological corridors for native up bottom species. So, the aim of this study was to understand how the artificial structure could alter the genetic makeup of two marine invertebrates. And in particular, we work on a limpet, Patella cerula, that were mainly found on the breakwater. Um, structure along the coast and um, serpulid polychaetes, pomatoceros tricators that live on the shell of Mytilus gallus provincialis that is one of the most abundant species in oil uh, offshore platform. Next. Our study on uh, limpet patella cerula found a lower genetic diversity on artificial than natural substrate along the, the Adriatic coast. 
Similar results were found for the serpulid pomatocellus tricators, colonizing offshore platforms in the same regions, making us hypothesizing that the reduced genetic diversity on artificial structures may be due to the selection resulting from the differing environment of the structures themselves. Next. The presence of species complex in the sea can confound also ecological study and mislead management strategies. For example, connectivity patterns may be erroneously inferred when cryptic species are ignored, which may provide biased conclusion about the overall capacity of the population to resist stress. In the Mediterranean Sea, the hexacoral Parazoanthus axinelle species complex is one of the most common cnidaria. The simplicity of the zoanthid body plan makes morphology-based species identification quite challenging. In the Mediterranean, we know that exists two morphotypes of the Parazoanthus axinelle. One of them displays a longer trunk, longer and thinner tentacles, and a light yellow color, and is mainly widespread all along the coast while the other morphotype has a more pronounced orange color and a shorter and thicker trunk and tentacles. And this, uh, these morphotypes is mainly uh, observed along the northwestern Mediterranean coast. Next. Using both mitochondrial and single nucleotide polymorphism marker, our study made in 2020 evidenced that the two morphotypes are indeed two different species. The two guides, more interesting, show also a contrasting genetic pattern among population. And in fact, they show the presence of a different structure, um, as, uh, both with mitochondrial and molecular and nuclear marker. In fact, the yellow morphotype that is more widespread along the coast shows a less genetic structuring compared to the orange morphotype that, despite the restricted distribution, is uh, more uh, genetically structured. The hidden diversity within one of the most flagged species in the Mediterranean Sea, like the Parazoanthus axinelle, uh, even in a well-studied uh, geographical area, such as the Mediterranean Sea, calling us for a careful taxonomy re-evaluation of other key species, also in other geographical areas, for a better conservation issue. Studies on connectivity in the last year have also given us the opportunity to better understand the effectiveness of the deep reef refuge hypothesis. This hypothesis stipulates that the deep reef areas are protected from disturbances that affect shallow reef areas and that can provide a viable reproductive source for shallow reef. We tested this hypothesis on, in the two Mediterranean gorgonian, namely the precious red coral, Coralium rubrum, and the white gorgonian, Euricella singularis. For all the species, we performed a sample design collecting colonies from shallow around 10 meters to 70 meters distance, the depth, sorry. For both the species, we found a genetic isolation between shallow and deep population with a barrier to gene flow around 30-40 meter depth. And uh, we related to the, this barrier to gene flow to a physical barrier that is uh, present in the summer named the summer thermocline. These results were extremely important for a conservation point and management point of view because in the case of Coralium rubrum, they provide a strong scientific basis for the recommendations that were made by the General Fishery Commission of the Mediterranean Sea to ban the Coralium rubrum harvesting from 0 to 50 meter depth. Moreover, while for Coralium rubrum, recolonization of shallow water population cannot fuel by larvae from other shallow water population, uh, due to their restricted larva dispersal and philopatric behavior that we observed in a small scale study that we performed in two locations along the northwestern Mediterranean coast. 
For Enigella singularis, shallow water population should then be mainly fueled by larvae from other shallow water population. This is extremely important for this species because in the last year there was affected by a lot of mass mortality events. And our study suggests that we found that larval transport is a dominant driver of recent gene flow among the population, at least in our uh, region of analysis that was the Gulf of Lyon. Horizontal connectivity between mesophotic ecosystems represents a further topic of interest, in particular whether the connectivity is different from population observed from shallow reefs reef across the same region. Mesophotic ecosystems are defined as light-dependent reef community from 30 to 150 meter depth, containing diverse assemblages of coral in the tropical region and mainly dominated by algae in temperate habitats. Organisms living in these habitats generate complex three-dimensional structures that have an important ecological role since they directly or indirectly modulate the availability of resources to other species, causing changes to the abiotic or abiotic features. We performed several studies on these mesophotic habitats, and also in this case, we observe a different pattern of structuring depending on the species of interest, with high level of connectivity observed among population in the deep Gorgonian Paramoricia macrospina in the Menorca channel, and with more highly structured population in the case of Corallium rubrum, and this was mainly related to the its patchy distribution of suitable habitats among deep coral banks. Another interesting species we worked on was the black coral Antipatella supinnata. Antipatella supinnata is one of the most frequently observed black coral at mesophotic depth, particularly in the northwestern part of the Mediterranean Sea, where its population can reach high density and create forest-like aggregation, both along the coast and in offshore locations such as sea mounds. As such, these coral are targeted by recreational and artisanal fisheries, and are vulnerable to human impact due to their arborescent morphology and low growth rates. In this case, we use a restriction site associated DNA analysis, so the TUBIRAD, to evaluate fine scale population structure of the Mediterranean black coral Antipatella supinnata. And we would like to, un to understand which population could serve as po a potential source of genetic diversity for adjacent population. Colonies from two offshore localities, a Ligurian Sea Mount and a Tyrrhenian Canyon, and four coastal populations from Liguria and Calabria were sampled and genotyped. Significant genetic differentiation was recorded between coastal and offshore population. This, indi this indicates that offshore Antipatella supinnata population gardens are uh, potentially less resilient to human impact, so mainly to, do fi to fishing, to, to a limited influx of larvae from adjacent habitat, highlighting the vulnerability of this forest and the importance of enforcing conservation and management measures to preserve this vulnerable marine ecosystem. Finally, in the last two years, we are moving from single species studies to a community scale approach. In fact, since connectivity structures, marine communities, its pattern and magnitude are expected to control at which special scale biodiversity should be monitored. Marine monitoring, in fact, should move from the use of indicators groups to a more comprehensive community level analysis. Beta diversity, the turnover in species composition through space and time, can be viewed as measure of the isolation of an individual location species assemblages from the regional species pool. Low beta diversity, so high similarity in species composition among sites sharing common environmental features, can therefore be safely interpreted as evidence that populations are well mixed through dispersal, so they have high connectivity. 
However, high beta diversity, so low similarity in species composition, can provide evidence of isolation only after the influence of post settlement processes has been ruled out. So, joint application of genetic and community measures of similarity will likely provide the best insight into the scale and degree of connectivity among population and communities. To reach this goal, in 2018, we started an European project named CMOB to define a solution for semi-automatic monitoring on benthic biodiversity. Within the project, we are trying to describe community composition across location in the Mediterranean Sea through the deployment of autonomous reef monitoring system that Titolo Tufo has explained very well this morning. We combine a traditional method like taxonomic expertise, photo identification, morphological identification with DNA barcoding and meta barcoding. We are deployed autonomous reef monitoring structure in several sites across the Mediterranean Sea in 2018 and we have retrieved them in 2019 installing at the same time new artificial structure that have been retrieved last summer. Results from this study will allow having information about spatial and temporal variability in community composition across location but also can give information on connectivity pattern of several target species, particularly abundant within the structures, but with different life history traits. Finally, this study will increase the knowledge of the Mediterranean cryptibiotic uh, the, before, okay, of the Mediterranean cryptibiota and will provide a better understanding of the reef community and will enable more informed management decision. Next. So, what we can suggest for the future, I think that for the future we have to increase the knowledge of the deep sea habitat for which only very limited and patch information still exists. Moreover, it will be very important to increase the knowledge on marine ba barriers and how they can interact with the life history trait of the species to determine marine functional connectivity. Finally, with the new technology approach, like for example, metabarcoding and environmental DNA, they, I think that they can implement uh, in a fast way and uh, an easy way um, the knowledge of marine connectivity at the community level. So to conclude, I would like to say that it is always useful to increase the relationship among scientists of different backgrounds, like for example, oceanographers, ecologists, zoologists, and biologists, to have an omnicomprehensive view of marine functional connectivity. Moreover, I think that we should start to facilitate the incorporation of marine functional connectivity data in, into decision making for resource and ecosystem management at a regional, national, and global scale. And and finally, I think that uh, is the time to force the awareness of the importance of conservation of marine benthic biodiversity all around the globe. To conclude, I would like to thank to all the people that uh, allow me to, to, to work on this uh, interesting topic and in particular of all the students that uh, are involved on the CIMO project. Uh, without them, uh, we cannot go on with this uh, huge project. Thank you. Thank you, Federica, for such an inspiring and interesting uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, uh, you can come back later for, for the discussions. And I'm going to tell everyone that you can uh, write questions at the chat uh, comments, comments and, and questions. Then we will have a moment after presentations to discuss, okay? Now I'm going to, to invite Professor Jose Maria Landin Dominguez. Okay, sounds okay, I'm here. <clears throat> so let me introduce you, please. Uh, Professor Dominguez has a BS and a master's degree in geology from the Federal University of Bahia with focus on sedimentology. 
He completed his doctorate in marine geology and geophysics at a uh, residential school of marine and atmospheric sciences at the University of Miami in 1987. He's currently a full professor in coastal and sedimentary geology at the Federal University of Bahia and coordinates the INCT, Anthropic Tropical Marine Environment. He works in the areas of oceanography, geology, and marine geophysics and coastal geology. His main research interests are origin, origin and evolution of the coastal zone and continental shelf, variations in sea level, coastal dynamics, marine sedimentation, coastal erosion, and deltat deltatic sedimentation. He's a CNPQ researcher 1A. Please, Professor Domingos, uh, feel comfortable. Thank you very much, Paulo. I'll share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Yes, okay. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the, the invitation to participate in the summer school. And <clears throat> I'll be talking this afternoon on coastal erosion across different spatial and temporal scales. And uh, coastal erosion is a natural process intrinsic to the process of sediment transport and deposition on the coastal zone. It's a geological hazard because if nobody lived near the coastline, it would have no importance to us. This phenomenon would have no importance to us. And uh, uh, many human activities have contributed in many ways to exacerbate the coastal erosion phenomenon. And, uh, for example, if you look at this image, it is a Caravela's strand plain in southern Bahia. Uh, you can see here in the, the, the right lower corner uh, a location map. And uh, overall, this coastal plain has experienced progradation during the Holocene, during the last 5,000 years. The coastline progressed more than 10 kilometers. But this progradation was not uniform, it was interrupted by severe episodes of coastal erosion. So although overall the shoreline has prograded, uh, this progradation was interrupted by episodes of severe erosion. So when you talk about uh, shoreline erosion, we have to define what's the time span we are considering because uh, as you can see in this in this image, the same place the upper photograph was taken in 1999, the lower photograph in 29, and you can see the same place it was eroding in 1999, and 10 years later, uh, the the beach has has recovered, completely recovered. So, when you talk about shoreline erosion or progradation, you have to define what's the time uh, interval that we are considering. So I'll, I'm going to start to talk about this, try to, to convey an understanding of uh, uh, how the long-term evolution of the coastal zone determines if uh, it has a overall or tendency for erosion or progradation or equilibrium. So from a long-term spatial and temporal perspective, uh, the position of the shoreline is controlled by the way the sedimentary record accumulates. And the sedimentary record is a result of creation of accommodation space, usually sea level rise, and sediment supply to infuse this accommodation space. And we have uh, two major factors controlling this sedimentary rocket record and and uh, and the position of the shoreline one is the relief and size of drainage base and others the rainfall in the drainage base so in this map of brazil you can see the major sediment delivery routes to the coastal zone and you can rapidly see that the major uh, area of uh, of uh, contribution of 
continental sediments, sediments, river in sediments to the coastal zones, the Amazon basin, and followed by the, the, the La Plata basin. And um, we have all this, this smaller area here in northern Brazil, is the drainage basin of the Panaíba River. Uh, this eastern seaboard of Brazil, which has also a large sediment contribution, and the northeastern coast of Brazil, where uh, the sedimentary basins are small, and we can expect a low uh, contribution of sediments coming from the continent. When you look at the rainfall, you can see that uh, uh, it's exactly this northeastern region of Brazil uh, characterized by a small amount of rainfall uh, uh, along the during the year. So it's a semi-arid or arid climate. And uh, using precipitation as a proxy, you can say that uh, the northern coast has a high sediment supply, the eastern coast high sediment supply, but the northeastern coast has a, a much reduced sediment supply coming from the continent. And then when you look at the sediment flux to the coastal zone, uh, indeed, the northern portion of Brazil is where uh, we have the largest contribution of sediments. The eastern coast, we have uh, also a significant contribution of, of river in sediments, although smaller. But uh, as in this region, is, 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 is the, this is the region where we have uh, most of the wave-dominated deltas uh, on, on, the, on the coast of Brazil. And the northern eastern coast, it receives actually a very, very reduced amount of sediment, very, very reduced sediment flux. When you combine the sediment flux with the dominant oceanographic process, the northern coast is a tide dominated coast, uh, whereas the eastern and southern coast of Brazil is a macro tidal coast. It means that uh, Spring tidal range here is less than two meters, and up here in the north, spring tidal range is up to uh, it's more than the, the four meters. Accommodation space is created by sea level rise, and uh, during the last uh, 16,000 years, sea level rose from minus 125 meters below present to the present position. Uh, uh, it means a, a, a rise of about 120 meters, and this create, inundated the, the, the continental shelves and the coastal zone, and then created accommodation space, so sediments can infill the, this accommodation space, and therefore uh, originate or create a sedimentary record. So, uh, summarizing, you can say that for the, the Brazilian coast, we have a, a large supply of sediment in the northern coast. It indeed exports sediments to the Guianas coast. We have also a large sediment supply coming from the La Plata River, which nourishes the southern coast of Brazil, especially Rio Grande do Sul. In the hilly coast of uh, Rio de Janeiro, São Paulo, Paraná, and Santa Catarina, uh, because of this high relief, the drainage, uh, uh, the, the, the major rivers flow towards the interior and then to the La Plata Basin. In the eastern coast of Brazil, that we call the Deltaic coast of Brazil, is where we have the major rivers emptying in, in, in the ocean, like the San Francisco, the, pa the Paraíba do Sul, the Doce, the Injecciunha, and the northeastern coast that we call Starboard Coast because there is no almost no sediment. Uh, get into the, the coastal zone is a is a region where we have a recycling of sediments. And then when you look at the sedimentary record of these regions, we can see that uh, in the northern coast we have uh, a sedimentary record, we have extensive progradation of the coastline, uh, and because uh, it's a tide-dominated environment, this coastline is a 
is uh, this coastal zone is characterized by extensive mangrove forests. In the eastern coast, we also have a sedimentary record, uh, but because this region is uh, characterized by high wave energy, so it's a progradation of uh, sandy beaches. But in the northeastern coast, although we have uh, creation of accommodation space, there is no accumulation of sediment because there is no sediment uh, uh, coming from the continent and uh, to, to infill this space created by sea level rise. So this is uh, an example of uh, the northern coast of Brazil, progradation of mangrove swamps. In some places, the coastline advanced uh, more than 30 kilometers. This is the eastern coast, the delta of the Jacutionha River, where have progradation of more than 15 kilometers. And instead of mangroves, like we have in, in the northern coast, we have a succession of beach ridges. And then in the northeastern coast, we have uh, tertiary sediments, the Barreiras Formation, reaching the coast and forming uh, active sea cliffs. So when you compare this segment of Brazilian coast with the northern coast and the eastern coast, you can see that uh, during the last maybe 15 million years, there has no accumulation of sediments because uh, the Barreiras sediment was deposited in the middle, in the uh, in the early middle Miocene, uh, around 50, 20, 20, 50 million years ago. So it's not a surprise that the severest cases of shoreline erosion in Brazil are concentrated in this section of the Brazilian seaboard. In between. Uh, the major uh, river mouth, the most important river mouths, like uh, we have here the Jacquin Delta and the Dos Delta, uh, the coastline is usually starved of sediment because uh, of a well known uh, tendency of the size of the drainage basins to decrease as we approach the coastline. So we have this major drainage basins coming from the interior of the continent. And in between this major uh, uh, river systems, we have only very small drainage basins that does not bring enough sediment to the coast. So in most of the, 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 the segments in between major river mouths, uh, usually the, 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 the coastline is also starved in sediments. Superimposing this large scale control uh, there are some causes of shoreline erosion. I'd like to emphasize this uh, four major causes, especially the, the first two, uh, dynamics of river mouths and dynamics of tidal deltas, but also human interventions because of construction of ports and dams and sandy capture in unconsolidated capes along the shoreline. So, the shoreline of the river mouth is very sensitive to river in discharge. Uh, usually, we have progradation after a, a, a large flood, like we have here in this image. After a large flood, the river uh, brings a lot of sediment to the river mouth. And in between these large floods, the, the waves rework the sediments, forming these beach reeds, and they had distribute these sediments uh, to both sides of, of the river mouth. So in this sense, uh, the position of the shoreline and river mouths are very sensitive to climate change as related to uh, changes in, in precipitation, rainfall in the drainage base, and also to river regulation because of construction of large dams. One classical example is the San Francisco River, uh, is one of the largest rivers in Brazil. And uh, there are six major dams that has been built uh, along the, 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 the river course. And uh, you can see here that uh, the monthly discharge uh, was highly seasonal, very high discharge during the, the summer. And uh, 
low discharge during the winter time. And you can see that uh, after, especially 1986, uh, the river was completely regulated. So the, the peak discharges were eliminated, but also there was a, a decrease in the volume of sediment brought by the river because uh, there has been a change in rainfall during the last decades in the, the drainage basin of the San Francisco. You can see here this graph where the, the, the red line represents the, uh, the stream flow and the, the blue line represents the monthly rainfall. And then you can see that the monthly rainfall in the, in the drainage basin has decreased during the last decades. And this was uh, 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 translated, this translated in a, in a reduction on, uh, in the stream flow, but also in a, an exacerbation of uh, the regulation effects of the major dams, which eliminated this uh, peak flows. As a result, we have uh, uh, extensive er erosion at the San Francisco River mouth that end up destroying the Cabeza village like we see here. here. And this, uh, this was, has been destroyed in, in the year 1998. And uh, you can see here in, in uh, a few years later, uh, the position where the lighthouse is right now. I call attention in this slide that uh, erosion does not destroy sediment. It just moves sediment from one place to the other. And you can see here that uh, the sediment has been eroded at the river mouth, has moved to the drum different side of uh, the, the delta plain. And in this down drift side, we had extensive progradation of the shoreline. So shoreline erosion, does not destroy sediment. It just moves sediment from, from one place to the other. Another example of the Delta of Jacques River. Uh, and uh, we can see here two animations. In the slower animation, you can see that the shoreline is retreating at the river mouth. And the sediment that is being eroded at the river mouth is being used to prograde the downdrift side of the Delta Plain. Uh, and causing also this extensive downdrift migration of this sand speeds. The behavior of the Jackson River mouth is, is similar uh, to the, the San Francisco because also in this uh, drainage base, the amount of rainfall during the last decades has decreased. Other types of, uh, other types of uh, shoreline erosion, uh, severe shoreline erosion is usually associated with dynamics of tide inlets. The tau vag of these tide inlets are constantly moving from one side to the other uh, in search of uh, a more efficiency in, in, in sediment transportation. And uh, because of that, we have uh, uh, erosion deposition in the alternate sides of the, the tide inlet, like we can see here in the Ponta dos Garcés, is uh, south of Salvador City where you can have uh, erosion progradation. So the amount of sediment uh, remains approximately the same, but uh, the distribution of sediments changes from one side to the other. So again, there is no destruction of sediment. It just changes from one side to the other of the tidal inlets. And uh, as you can see here, this, this is a, is a, a series of aero photographs. Uh, I call attention for this small house at this point. This is in 2003, it was threatened by erosion. And seven years later, there has been a extensive progradation in front of this house. And 10 years later, it again is threatened by shoreline erosion. So this kind of erosion uh, uh, is expected. It has nothing to do with sea level rise. So it has nothing to do with any uh, influence of uh, human activity. Other kind of uh, 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 erosion associated with tidal inlets is when you have uh, those sand spits blocking uh, the entrance of the tidal inlets. And uh, now and then the sand spits breach it. And uh, where it's breached it, to have erosion, but the sediments, the remaining of the sediments uh, 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 that was part of the, the sand spit is, is then used to uh, 
prograde the coastline in the downdrift, the downdrift region. Another example of the Italian river also in southern Bahia. And uh, this is Mag Seco, uh, where we have this dynamic here, where the, 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 the northern margin of the, the tidal net has retreated. This allowed the waves to propagate more intensely inside the portion of the estuary. And then you have this extensive erosion in the concave bank of the river that has resulted in extensive damage to a uh, second home. And, and finally, we have uh, uh, erosion caused by construction of uh, ports. Uh, some decades ago, usually we have this uh, 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 kind of structure blocking the transfer of sediment in order to create a, 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 a quiet zone in the, in, in the berth area. And the they lay port uh, as you can see in this graph, there has been accumulation of more than 300 meters of sediment in the uplift side of the port and uh, erosion of almost 100 meters in the downdrift side and, and the, the effect of uh, sediment uh, retention at the port extends almost 18 kilometers downdrift. And then uh, in the downdrift side, there has there has been extensive erosion. Like you can see here, this is a, a photograph of uh, 2009. The the red line is the the, the coastline in 1960. The same thing as in this other photograph, located the, at the downdrift side of the port, the coastline 1960, and then the sediment that uh, has been trapped up drift of the port. Uh, 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 triggered, triggered this uh, severe erosion uh, in the downdrift side. Even if the, the ports are constructed offshore, like we have here breakwater that are more than 2.5 kilometers offshore, it still affects the dynamics of the shoreline, causing deposition, forming this structure that we call salient. And the sediment that is trapped in here uh, is also cause uh, 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 it was trigger a shoreline erosion of the drift portion like we can see here in this uh, Inácio Barbosa terminal in Sergipe where we have accumulation uh, caused by the, the offshore breakwater and then the drift side you have a extensive shore, uh, shoreline erosion and finally uh, sediment capture in capes this is a very beautiful exemplified by the Ponta do Catoeira in Southern Bahia. We have here two images from two different uh, years. The, 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 the older one is in green, the younger in red, and you can see that uh, shoreline has retreated up drift of the uh, Cape Apex. And the, uh, this sediment that has, has been abroad is used to build or to extend the Cape in, in the longshore direction. And the retention of sediment here in the Cape caused extensive erosion down drift. And all this area located down drift uh, experienced shoreline retreat rates of more than five, 10 meters a year, uh, which is obliterating completely this large mangrove area. Mangrove area. The, response, the shoreline uh, response to, to erosion is not uniform because uh, depending on the morphodynamic state of the beach, uh, uh, erosion can be a three-dimensional phenomenon. In uh, intermediate beaches like, uh, like this one, characterized by uh, uh, rip currents, you can see that the erosion is usually concentrated in the headwater of uh, each of these beach currents. You can see here some trees falling on the beach, and in between the location of those rip channels, the shoreline is usually uh, less affected by uh, erosion. So, uh, concluding this this part of the talk, uh, this uh, recent paper that came out in scientific reports has shown that uh, using satellite images for comparing shoreline position using satellite images from 
1984 to 2016, they concluded that 24% of the world's sandy beaches are eroding, 28% are accreting, and 48% are stable. That's what I, 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 I said, that uh, shoreline erosion does not destroy the sediment. It just moves sediment from one place to the other. The only mechanism that destroys sediment during shoreline erosion is is shoreline erosion is caused by a rising sea level, and this is a major worry uh, in the scenario of uh, uh, climate change. So under climate change, other factors should be considered that can affect the severely the position of the shoreline. One is sea level rise, uh, and shoreline erosion caused by sea level rise can actually destroy sediment because move sediment offshore. The other extreme events and changes in wave climate, changes in rainfall and drain in the drainage basins. So we have four, you have predictions or scenarios of sea level rise that varies from 18 centimeters to up to two meters, uh, depending on the emissions uh, scenarios. And, and this, uh, we, should, we should really worry about this because uh, this will, will really cause extensive erosion in, in all shorelines in the world. And this erosion is caused by the broom rule. If you, if you rise to the level, the, the shore face profile that is adjusted to one position of shoreline of the sea level, if you rise to the level, uh, this profile will migrate upwards and landwards in order to re-equilibrate. And uh, in, in this process, it will cause shoreline erosion in the upper portion of the profile and the sediments eroded will be deposited offshore. And then in this way, we have a permanent loss of sediment uh, uh, in the, from, the, from the coastline. And the other extreme events. Extreme events, uh, as you can see here, if, if we increase wave heights, uh, the chances of uh, uh, having episodes of severe erosion in the shoreline will also increase. This in, in Northern Bahia is a, 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 a dune ridge that blocks this small river, the Capivara River. And uh, uh, along the dune ridge, you have some areas that are low lying where there's no coconut trees. And these are areas that usually are breached when, when we have this uh, uh, extreme events. The last extreme event that breached this this uh, Dune Ridge was in, in 2017, and uh, the Dune Ridge was breached exactly in this position, and uh, we have we had this situation like here. Finally, this uh, uh, just few slides, just few slides. Uh, what are the responses to face this problem? We have a hard defense, which is building a seawall. We have beach erosion. We have relocation. We have setbacks. In terms of hard defense, it's just like we have in, in Pernambuco, where we put a lot of uh, stones, revetments, groins, and seawalls in try, trying to protect the, the, the property. Like also in this, in this case, in, in, in north of Aracaju, Sergipe. We can also have uh, beach erosion, but which is which in this case is, is just to find a source of sediment located offshore and bring the sediment and uh, uh, rebuild the beach that was lost because of uh, shoreline erosion. The other uh, is relocation, where you simply physically move a built structure to a position more in the interior in order to avoid the destruction of the property uh, by, by shoreline erosion. This is a famous uh, Cape Ateras lighthouse that was moved uh, inshore or move entire houses. And uh, uh, we can have coastal sediments. That is the cheapest, uh, cheapest measure to face the problem of shoreline erosion. And uh, to establish this coastal setbacks, we need to have the, we have to determine the historical rates of shoreline retreats. We have to consider all sea level rise scenarios and uh, what kind of erosion each scenario uh, uh, can produce, can cause in the shoreline. 
we have to take into account also the extreme events and take into account changes in wave climate. The only case in Brazil that uh, I'm aware where this was done was in the Paiva Beach in Pernambuco, where uh, as a requirement for for the licensing of this area, the 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 the, the municipality required to calculate required the, the, the entrepreneurs to calculate uh, where would be the position of the shoreline after six years and was done a modeling was done of, of the position of shoreline including the historical retreats of the shoreline the rates of historical retrieval shoreline transversal sediment exchanges during storms and uh, the prediction of shoreline retreats for different scenarios of sea level rise. It, and then at the end, uh, it was concluded that uh, if, you, if you had a setback between 20 and uh, 50 meters, would be enough to accommodate all future changes in shoreline. So uh, in order to have an extra margin of security, uh, was added 20 meters more, and at the end, the the the, the subdivision was licensed, uh, considering a 50 meter setback along the entire coast, uh, but for the northern portion, where a setback to 220 meters was required because of the high variability associated with this river mouth. The point is that uh, uh, the area was occupied, a 50 meters setback was also respected. But as soon as we had the first storm that uh, caused a shoreline retreat in front of the property, the owners, uh, uh, the, the owners became became really worried because uh, they they thought that uh, uh, in the incoming years all the area would 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 be eroded and and uh, the property would would end up being being threatened by shoreline erosion and uh, we doubt being aware that during the license process this 50 meter setback was established just to accumulate retreats of shoreline retreat in the next 60 years. So uh, that's what I, I'd like to say. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm sorry for extending a few more minutes. Hello. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Something went wrong.
Hi. Sorry, Lanjin, we have some technical issues. Uh, Thank you very much for your awesome presentation, which is nice. It's very uh, interesting. Everything went okay? Yeah. Could you see it up to the end? Excuse could me? You follow, could you follow the presentation yeah. up to the end? Okay. Sure. sure. Perfect. Sure. Thank you. So very I'll nice stop sharing my, my screen. Thank you very much. So uh, now I'd like to invite Professor Monica Costa. She received a BS degree in oceanography at the, at the State University of Rio de Janeiro in 1988. And since then, she post-graduated in chemistry at Puki Hill and environmental sciences at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, United Kingdom. Ten years later, she started working at oceanography department of Federal University of Pernambuco, where she still teaches and supervises research on marine pollution at all academic levels. Welcome, Professor Monica. Please. Thank you, Paul. So I will share my screen and start my presentation. Okay. So can you see the presentation full screen? Paulo, can you see the presentation? Is it okay? It's perfect. Good. So before I face the challenge of speaking after these two colleagues, uh, I would like to thank the organization of the third Fortaleza Austro Spring School for the invitation. I feel honored to be here with you. It's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to speak to you all. So good afternoon to those who are in America and good evening for those who are in Europe. Um, my talk is not about uh, marine pollution. As Paulo said, that is my main speciality, my main interest. I will try to refrain to speak about plastics and microplastics, at least for this time. Although a couple of slides about marine debris might appear along the uh, very short presentation that I have for you. What I will talk, to, talk about this afternoon with you is um, a few elucubrations <laughs> of a supervisor and because I'm not alone in these elucubrations, I present to you my two uh, forever co-authors, Professor Maria Cristina Araújo from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte and Professor Jaqueline Cavalcante from the Federal Rural University of Pernambuco. Hi, apparently Monica has some problem at, uh, with her internet connection. You're going to wait a little bit for to see if everything gets okay.
Hi. We're experiencing some uh, technical issues. That's the new normal. <laughs> I'd like to invite the next speaker, Professor Lorenzo Bramanti. Hi, Lorenzo. Let me introduce you. Um, Professor Lorenzo Bramanti is senior researcher at LECOB TNRS at Observatoire Oceanologique de Bonneus sur Mer. His line of research focuses on conservation, ecology, and population dynamics of benthic suspension feeders, mainly corals. In the Mediterranean Sea, he works with, uh, on conservation and ecology of Gorgonians, especially the precious uh, Mediterranean red coral. In the Caribbean, he works with, in cooperation with California State University, Northridge, and University of Buffalo in the ecology of and population and population dynamics of octocorals in the U.S. Virgin uh, Islands. In the Pacific Ocean, Taiwan and French Polynesia, he focuses his research on recovery dynamics of coral reefs and on the effects of ocean acidification. In the last years, he expanded his researches to uh, the mesophotic habitat with projects in South Sardinia, Italy, and in Moria, French Polynesia. Overall, he co-authored more than 100 scientific publications and book chapters, and co-edited uh, the Springer book, Animal Forests uh, of the World. Professor Lorenzo, please. Uh, hi, okay, uh, nice to meet you. Perfect. Well, I'm gonna present uh, my, my talk today would be uh, a talk that I, I want to draw the attention of the person of the fact that uh, for the restoration of the corals is needed a scientific approach. So I will take the example of the Mediterranean red coral, Corallium rubrum, but for a more general uh, example. So just an introduction as we, there are a lot of people all around the world, uh, probably not everybody, everyone knows the red coral, the Corallium rubrum is a family corallide, is an alcyonace of the family corallide, is an octocoral, is a modular organism, is composed by different polyps, is endemic to the Mediterranean Sea and some neighboring, neighboring rocky shores, and has a wide bathymetric range, can be found from, from 10 meters to up to 800 to 1,000 meters. It's a gonochoric species, there, is male, there are male and female colonies, and has a sexual reproduction. It is a long-lived, slow-growing species. The, the grow rate are very slow. Imagine that uh, we calculated like uh, some kind of less than uh, almost half millimeters in diameter per year. And it's overexploited due to its uh, high economic value. So in fact, the, the, raw the, the skeleton, the axial skeleton is used as a raw material for jewelry. And it's also um, sensitive to mortalities linked to temperature increase. Red coral harvesting is uh, decreasing since the, since the when, when we have data, more precise data since the 70s, is decreasing, which means in all over the Mediterranean, which means that the species is overexploited. So there are two, two, two strong fish. And uh, as you see on the, sorry, take the, the laser pointer, on this uh, slide, he also suffer, uh, the species also suffer from uh, mass mortality events linked, uh, linked to temperature increase. In the, the fishery and the, the harvesting and the temperature increase uh, resulted in a shift in colony size. This is an example from Marcel. This is a colony that was common, uh, which size was common to see 100 years ago. Now this is the normal size we can find in the shallow population of, of Corallium group. And uh, not only a shift in colony size, but also a shift in uh, popula population structure. Here we can see between these two, um, in the same place, Cap de Creus in the 84 and the 2002. In the 84, there were way more big colonies. These are the number of colonies, and then on the x-axis there is the uh, size class. So you see that uh, uh, after 20 years, 20, 30 years, the big colonies have disappeared, that the median size is uh, lower. 
And also in, uh, in uh, exploited and not exploited, here is uh, Medas Island is protected, Cap de Creus is not protected, the mean size is higher. So harvesting and, um, and um, mass mortality change the, the size of the colonies and the structure of the population. So this is uh, to, um, let's say, to say that, uh, an introduction how to say, why I'm speaking in my dual species? A dual spirit because uh, this is a species that is beautiful. I don't know if uh, someone of you uh, that uh, lucky to dive and see the red coral in his environment is a beautiful species with the red uh, bright skeleton and white polyps. It's a, it's, it's a, um, a characteristic of the seascape, so it's uh, in this engineering species, so it also has a, a ecological uh, um, ecological function. But it's also an object uh, of great value, economical value, it's precious, not only economical, but also from the point of view of art uh, and of culture. It's present in uh, Mediterranean and world culture since thousands of years, and is used uh, as um, raw material for jewelry in giving a, a, a big economic uh, um, exchange and uh, uh, um, let's think that uh, for example in Sardinia so in some places in Sardinia in Alghero for example people speak Catalan just because of the migration of people from Catalonia linked to the fishery of coral and also in the south of Sardinia, which is a place where there is a lot of, uh, and, uh, of red coral, there is a population in an island that speaks an ancient Genoan dialect. Also for the moving of people for the, um, for the fishery of red coral. So it's uh, has an importance in the culture. And th this is this uh, uh, double soul. It's uh, a beautiful species in its environment, but it's also an object of... Uh, uh, with with the uh, with value is a consumable, but this is not uncommon. If we think there are species in the in the in the environment that are beautiful wild creatures like the white boar or the buffalo, and, and uh, uh, are uh, their ecological role and, and are uh, beautiful species and uh, with their role in the in the environment, but they also uh, consumables. So they are used uh, for other um, for for human uh, consumption. And uh, in this sense, we don't find strange that there's a scientific approach also when these species are considered as, uh, as consumables. There are scientific um, journals that uh, publish high-level scientific uh, works with a scientific approach on the production or the bet best way on how to farm and uh, produce the species that are uh, consumables. We are more used to see uh, scientific publication on conservation and uh, on the science of wildlife and conservation. So we have uh, um, journals in which a lot of people present in the, in the talk now and that we talked before have published. And uh, in fact, uh, with the red coral, with corallium rubrum is not less important. So the science on corallium rubrum conservation is very advanced. We, we know a lot, we have a, a scientific approach that to the study of ecology, conservation, physiology, and population dynamics. And this brings to the publication of uh, several papers on the topics. A lot of different authors publish high level, high, high level, in high level journal, high ranked journal, the, the results on uh, physiology, ecology, conservation, uh, etc. But not only, this is in this uh, uh, very good system, the results that we have from the, from the, scientific, uh, the, the, from the scientific publication are used in conservation directly. So there are a lot of association or uh, uh, govern, govern, gov, not governmental, that take the decision on the basis of the science that is done uh, on the species. So, for example, uh, red corals have been put in the red list uh, from the IUCN. Uh, there are Natura 2000 and the Barcelona Convention used uh, a lot the data to, to decide where to put marine protected areas. The FAO in the JFCM, the General Fishery Commission of the Mediterranean, took 
a couple of times two important decisions for the red coral conservation based on our study, the, the study of our, of our colleagues. For example, the, the fishery, the harvesting with the dredging was blocked in 94 by FAO thanks to the studies of the researcher in the previous year. And recently, I uh, have the luck to be part of the committee that decided to block the fishery in the first 50 meters depth uh, on the basis of uh, studies and simulation, uh, etc. So there's, a, uh, uh, there's this uh, good uh, practice of uh, applying a scientific method and uh, having results and using it directly. And, uh, with this result, we arrived at a certain point that uh, I can say, uh, yes, uh, the problem of fishery from coastal areas is almost uh, eliminated. But let's uh, think about Italy, almost wherever in Italy in the coast, the fishery is prohib prohibited in the first 50 meters depth. So it means coastal areas are free. Uh, in Catalonia, uh, more, they, they, they blocked completely the fishery in all the coast of Catalonia. So now there are areas that, uh, that are free from fishery. And uh, what remains is what I showed you, a population that is uh, uh, affected by harvesting, the, the, the ancient harvesting, and affected by mass mortality, uh, above all in the first uh, 50 meters depth. So this is... The classical um, moment in which restoration and uh, conservation, but restoration uh, is needed because we eliminated the, the, the problem of the fishery. I kind of eliminated almost, there's also the illegal fishery, but it's uh, just the, 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 the legal fishery is blocked in the first 50 meters there. And uh, when we speak about restoration of coral, we speak about uh, mainly about transplantation. But transplantation, so um, let's say transplantation is more uh, effective and is very well uh, implemented uh, in tropical corals, tropical fast growing species. You can literally take a piece of a, of a tropical coral, put somewhere else and see it growing. Uh, we are speaking about the species that have uh, hundreds of years of a life cycle and the grow rate that are very, very slow. Um, which means that uh, sometimes transplanting a colony is probably see 100 years old and putting on another site with the risk of uh, unsuccess of the transplant is not the best way. And then uh, always regard, regarding the transplantation, there's a strange phenomenon that is that uh, scientists, when they speak about uh, ecology or conservation or management, they apply the scientific method. They do observation, experimental design. They use statistics to test the hypothesis and go step by step. But when, the, when it's the case of transplantation, it looks like, I don't know, if you look at the literature, the not very uh, rich scientific literature on transplantation, because there's a lot of uh, association and uh, friends of the coral, lovers of the coral reef, the transplant and transplant. But it looks like also scientists sometimes is they like go in a hysteric approach to transplant and they tra transplant, transplant, and then let's see what else. And this is strange because we are all people that we are supposed to apply this uh, scientific approach, but tra tra coral transplantation is a, is a kind of um, uh, exception. And so I, I, I want to present uh, my, my way in which I would propose the transplantation and the restoration or eventually the farming of these species apply a scientific method. And what does it mean? Which does not mean take, transplant and, and uh, wait to see what happens. But it means, for example, that uh, um, we spoke about trans transplantation. Okay, let's remember that these species, like a lot of um, uh, sessile species, so benthic suspension feeders, they produce a lot of larvae that through a series of event during the uh, pelagic larval duration, they are decimated. So for 1,000 larva produced, probably one arrived to be a new coral. So we have a lot of potential individual look for, to, to go to look for them, to transplant them. But we can uh, simply try to short circuit these, uh, these events and increase the success of uh, larval uh, settlement. Red coral, I remember that, uh, as I told at the start, as a 
gonococcus and uh, go sexual reproduction so there are male and female colonies uh, gamete uh, f- f- um, fertilize the um, female so the oocytes inside the, the female polyps which release larvae in one period of the year so once a year larvae stay one um, one month approximately in the in the water column they eventually settle with a very low larval success then they develop in a small polyp and becomes adult and eventually reproduce repro, reproduce so uh, normally this uh, this use of the larvae as a as a long idea so i did not invent anything uh, think that uh, in the 1751 marquis carlo maria ginori around livorno used to put some uh, uh, um, tiles with this uh, word the tiles with the, uh, writing this you see this is in latin it means that if someone find this tile it's um, it's, it should uh, bring back to the experimental uh, center so it's uh, i think it could be considered one of the first uh, um, experiment of citizen science and the 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 objective of marquis ginori was to have the in the settlement of corallium rubrum also of other species but the main, main, mainly of corallium rubrum which is very common in the world uh, 2000 to 200 or 300 years later i do almost the same thing but putting a little bit more uh, uh, fancy uh, um, instrument so i use uh, marble tiles and we propose the patented method to put these marble tiles in uh, way in places where uh, red coral is uh, high density and then foster the recruitment in these uh, marble tiles why in these marble tiles because it's easily um, easily studied because uh, we, the, the, the tile is a fixed surface, so we can do calculation of the spatial distribution, we can observe very easily, and we can detach the tiles and bring to the, to the lab. We then also propose for the restoration another um, like kind of uh, uh, interesting and uh, fancy uh, construct of uh, electroaccretion, so putting, not, not putting tiles made of uh, iron and uh, putting a zinc, anode that uh, foster the, the deposition of cultural carbonate to see if we can uh, have a substrate available for and it can work but slow the results uh, are, uh, are uh, still slow and uh, uh, in uh, the 80s in the uh, yes the, the 80s uh, in the 1980 something in monaco they constructed they deployed uh, big artificial caves which are meant to we were meant to uh, be used for a farming a, a kind of farming of the red coral at that time i have to say that this case were, were not put with a specific uh, uh, test uh, hypothesis to test but uh, the coral was put inside and we were with the, the, the scientists were waiting to see if there were uh, colonization etc and then the, the experiment was abandoned but uh, i lived uh, since i was uh, starting at university i lived in the idea of this uh, of these uh, artificial caves that all, always uh, interest my my fantasy and my my interest and in fact when i had the opportunity and i became myself a, a scientist I uh, developed this uh, device that I call uh, the Coral Hotel. It's a, it's a way in which my colleagues call it because uh, I put, uh, I take the, these uh, one meters cube cement uh, caves with a roof that is made of terracotta tiles that can be changed uh, in position like a Rubik cube. So I show you, this is, uh, you can say better. I put six of these, uh, of these um, uh, caves in the, at known distance in the form of a hexagon inside the cave i can uh, arrange arrange the sex ratio and the density so i can put all females uh, and one male or i can change this and i can test hypothesis of optimal sex ratio to see what is the best sex ratio to have the, the higher f- fertilization fertilization rate fertilization distance as the scale of three meters at the scale of six meters and at the scale of more than 20 meters that which are the the natural population of this uh, this case these caves are put at uh, 30 meters depth and thanks to the to the uh, to the use of uh, rebreather uh, diving 
We can, uh, I, I like to consider this an underwater laboratory, laboratory for hypothesis testing. So what I want to see now is that what I will, was telling at the start, uh, I want to avoid to put these caves and put corals inside and wait to see what happens. But I want to use this as a laboratory, underwater laboratory. And uh, the high, uh, the, 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 the long time of diving allowed from this system allow me to stay more than one hour at 30 meters and work on this uh, system and what I do in this system. So as I told you at the start, I, I test hypothesis mass sex ratio, fertilization rate, fertilization distance. Then on the tiles, I can extract the tiles when they are, uh, you know, when they are uh, uh, colonized and bring in the laboratory. In the laboratory, I can study special distribution and post-settlement survival. You see here, for example, there's the nearest, nearest neighbor distance on the settlers, and I can see if the distribution change with time. So if there's a processes of self-thinning, the auto-thinning auto of the colonies, if the mortality is not uh, random. So the distribution change to rand from random to, aggre to aggregate, to ordinate with time, meaning that uh, there's a uh, not random mortality and they tend to a distance, a fixed distance that, that eventually in case of, tra of transplanting is the distance that I want to have before to avoid the, the forests that are to be too dense. Then on the tiles that are colonized by the other um, organisms, I can study by 3D reconstruction. I can study uh, the microstru microstructural settlement preference of the larvae. So, for example, it looks like the larvae likes to settle at the interface between uh, uh, other uh, carbonatic uh, species like the Serpulidia and the, and the substrate. Like probably they like to be very well attached or protected. In fact, we see with statistical tests, so we have an hypothesis, we make the experiment, the observation, and we have the result. We see that there's a preference to be attached close to the, um, to the serpulids. Then we can bring the colonies from the, from the, out, from the in situ, in ex situ in laboratory, and do experiment of uh, larval production, um, have larval production that uh, facilitate other experiments. You see here, we have the, Probably this is the first movie of a, of a, a reproduction of Mediterranean red coral in uh, life. You see the larva is going to exit. These are brooders, so the larva exit. And then we can uh, um, try to study the settlement success, success and increase it for, for, the, um, for the objective of the uh, semi-natural uh, condition rearing and study the intraspecific intra competition. So we, have the, we are able to uh, have a reproduction of larva, a, a release of larva, keep maintain the larva, have the settlement and have the recruitment. So all these stages can be uh, obtained and uh, studied under, uh, under some uh, controlled condition and then also put in the field in semi-control condition. Uh, this allows us to uh, study the settlement cues, so the larval preference, and other important things that have to be uh, taken into account if we want to propose this. That uh, I forgot to say that this uh, way to use the sexual the, the larvae for the restoration is a kind of alternative to the transplantation that uh, is not invented by me, but is common also in tropical coral. It's called sexual coral restoration. So he, 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 this, uh, this philosophy, let's say these uh, techniques, based the, the principle on the principle that uh, if you shortcut the mortality of the larva and you increase the larval success, you have uh, a way more efficient way. So for example, if, it, if to transplant one colony from one place to another, I need 10 minutes, in 10 minutes I can have the settlement of 1,000 larvae. So it's uh, scaling up the, um, the the restoration effectiveness and the transplantation. So it's like kind of transplantation, but uh, from when they're young, make them settle on uh, artificial substrate. Then you can move the artificial substrate and there's no stress for, uh, of transplantation because the colony on the, on the substrate does not realize to have been moved. 
So uh, also here, also this opens the the possibilities of testing uh, hypotheses. So, so step by step, we construct a protocol for uh, for the reading. Last but not least, just to show you how much is possible, what, what is possible to do when we try to do our job, that is scientists, we even use synchrotron uh, observation and uh, ultra precise Microsoft uh, micros microscope. Uh, uh, observation to have these are two recruits. This is a 17 years old uh, uh, small uh, coral, I call it baby coral, baby coral. And this is one year old. What we do uh, at the stereo microscope, we don't see a lot, but we see, for example, that the uh, deposition of sclerite is already present. Sclerites are small calcium carbonate structures that are present embedded in the living tissue of the coral. So they are present way before the axial skeleton is present. They probably have a role in the protection, mechanic protection. And we even observe at the scanning electron microscope that we can see the processes of calcification of the first four years, changing the way in which consider the grow rate and the energy consumption of these, uh, of these species. So this, this is the way in which we know what happens in the first year and we can act in, in facilitating and increasing the possibility of survival. So uh, at, at the end, uh, I think that the, the message I wanna I wanna I wanna share with you is, is clear. So in conclusion, I can say we have seen that corallium rubrum, but as other species, this is an example because it's the species that I studied since I since uh, years. It is an object. is a is a natural. A beautiful uh, wild species that have to be treated like that uh, as a wild species. So conservation, uh, studying the ecology, the role of ecology, but it's also an object of uh, a, a consumable. And we cannot uh, close the eyes on this. So it's better if we also have a, a parallel uh, studies that focus on this, uh, this thing, but on this uh, role uh, of the species. But with a scientific approach. So harvesting issues have been almost eliminated, at least for shallow population. So active restoration or farming are, uh, are ready to start now, not before. Transplantation with, uh, versus sexual restoration. At, on my opinion, transplantation is, if, it's, uh, if it can be used, it has to be used uh, only in the growing tropical species. In this species, but also in other in other uh, occasion, I would prefer sexual restoration that is based on the on the concept of a high uh, repro reproduction of the production of high number of um, of larvae. All this and my, my this is the fine the take home message has to be done with the scientific approach, hypothesis testing step by step. So uh, try to avoid. Uh, the hysteric approach that I see in a, in a lot of uh, cases of transplant, transplant, and see what happened, but do our job of scientists, test an hypothesis, uh, um, verify it, and step by step with the final goal of a scientific-based protocol for restoration and farming, farming, on which the association, the friends of corals, and the citizen can be based, so can be based Directly on the protocol that is based on the scientific, scientific, science, science-driven protocol. So I hope that uh, the message is clear. Clear. I thank you for uh, the attention, and I'm happy to answer to your question when it's uh, time. Hi. Hi, Lorenzo. Thank you very Hi. much for your presentation. And now we are trying again with Monica. She's back. So, Monica, let me introduce you again. Uh, Professor Monica received a BS degree in oceanography at State University of Rio de Janeiro in 1988. And since then, she post graduated in chemistry at Puki Hill and Environmental Sciences at University of East Anglia in Norwich, United Kingdom. 
Ten years later, she started working at the oceanography department of the Federal University of Pernambuco, where she still teaches and supervises research on marine pollution at all academic levels. Dr. Monica, please do your time. Thanks for the reintroduction, Paulo. I will start again. We had a quick power cut here in Recife. So I will share my screen. And, um, here we go. I will, as I was telling you, I will talk about two PhD works that were developed in different places here in Pernambuco. And my talk will be mainly about some ideas that we had to, to make a consensus, a convergence point between two apparently very different worlds. So one, a deal with the conservation issues in an estuarine extractive, extractive reserve, uh, and the other one work in an urban beach. So this time I'm not going to talk about marine pollution specifically, but how it happens in the middle of a broader, broader scenario. So management and conservation obviously have a strong relationship. What we saw in, 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 in the field during these two works was that depending on the point of view, people who do management thought that conservation could be one of their goals and the people who did conservation thought that manage, management could be one of their tools. But they were not very happy to talk to each other and basically to work together. So this is uh, possibly the main uh, difficulty that coastal environments face nowadays is the integration of the different areas into a wider study that can actually bring some positive change to the environment in question. The main conflict between these two uh, teams, the conservation and the management team, was about making the full management cycle to happen, respecting conservation timing. We have this very bad uh, joke that uh, this management cycle from issue observation, planning, action, monitoring, and the assessment to observe the question again, here in Brazil, it has to happen in four years because that's the time an elected candidate has to be re-elected. But conservation not always works in these speeds. Some things are quicker and some things are slower than four years. So what we saw in both environments, the estuary and the urban beach, was that the cycle was not being fully respected. It was not being fully um, understood. So this cycle, it looks very much like another cycle that we scientists know too well, which is the method we use to study our issues. So we start with an observation and a question, we plan an experiment, we run it, we get the results, we assess the results and we bring new questions into science. So this is also the way we should probably um, do things in our lives. So if we go around, as Lorenzo said, hysterically doing things, the results are not possible to be assessed. And then you come and you make the same mistakes over and over again and then you complain about life. In management and in science, it's the same thing. Method is, is everything that will bring you to analyzable results 
if you don't plan, you don't have results to analyze and then make more um, better informed choices. So the problems we have identified in both places. So there, this, these are pictures of both places that we studied. What are your conservation objectives? What are your management objectives? So we observed that there was a, a huge difficulty into setting goals, into saying, where do I want to go with my actions? How fast can I get there? with safety, who will do it? Academia will do it? No, academia won't do it. Academia might feed it with information, but that's all. It's managers who will do it. How it can be achieved? We can help design the how, but we will only help because the how and the who and how fast and above all, how much will it cost and where the money will come from will have to be a decision taken together with managers. Academia will help, but also with public participation. So the extractive reserve has a strong um, public participation DNA, but it doesn't mean that they are properly um, that they are properly uh, listened to, and that the, their ideas are put into plans. And when we think about an urban beach at full like this, you think. Who will represent the people when decisions need to be made? Who will be there to give ideas? Who will be there to express our demands? So since 20 years, when we started studying these two environments, a lot has changed and a lot has been done, both by scientists and by decision makers. So we will talk a little bit about it. These two places are only 80 kilometers apart, so there is no reason why they shouldn't uh, profit from what is uh, found about one and the other. They are both coastal sites in the same state. So even if we started with two very different research themes, we have arrived at very similar research conclusions. So what we will try to do now is to approach to, uh, is to make these results converge and talk to each other. So we can transplant results from one side to the other, respecting their characteristics. So, the two coastal environments that we have observed had both resources and services working there. In the case of the estuary, there was the identification of a talent for nature conservation and fisheries. And in the case of the urban beach, there was um, the identification of a overcrowded environment that had changed too much in the last 70 years since the um, since after World War II. Both sites had their own uses and demands, but here we already observed that they had a similarity. One was mainly used by traditional populations like fishermen and fisher um, folk and um, Indian populations. 
and also African American populations that were um, that were established there more than 100 years ago. And on the beach, the main user, despite being in Recife, was the local population. We had we had until um, a few years ago this um, distorted idea that the beach was used by tourists. And when we went there to survey, we found out that the tourists are a very small proportion of beach users. What we really have is the local population. So anything that will change to the better on, on this side will change to the better to those who are actually living there and paying taxes. So we decided to um, ask our questions based on the natural and human variables that we observed. In the case of the uh, extractive re reserve at the estuary, the main question that was um, floating around wa was how much can they fish of each species, especially um, uh, bivalves. What was the carrying capacity? We could determine that. We could do experiments to experiments to determine that. And if the protection category of the marine protected area that was established was correct, or if needed uh, some correction, some adjustment. On the case of the urban environment, the question was um, a question that caused a lot of uh, discussion at the time. We had to ask it, what is the minimum quality acceptable for this site? We are not going to transform this highly uh, occupied urban beach in a paradise beach that is in, in the imaginary of all of us with coconut trees and all, all the stereotypical uh, conditions of a tropical beach. This is an urban place. This is a place where we will have to uh, live with the city. So what is the minimum quality acceptable? What can we do in terms of requalification? Do we need or do, can we or should we go to a certification? Finally, how are the condi conditionings of the, the planning for each of the sites? So the conditionings for the estuary sites were on federal level because it is the border between two states and the marine protected area is a federal unit. On the other side, at the urban beach, the conditionings were at the municipal level, especially now that Brazil has created tools and laws and tools that allow the municipality to be the greatest um, stakeholder into beach management. So this um, final uh, line of thinking, this is only the first box in our management cycle. We didn't even move from the first box yet to see things happening and collecting new results and also um, being able to reassess and make new suggestions. So this is where academia has been mainly in, in the observation and we did not set off uh, real experiments in these two fields. We are still doing research to feed the um, decision makers and allowing them to have enough information for them to call the population and make their choices together. So the two main issues that we have found in these places were not coastal management issues. They were management issues very common to almost every city, every municipality, and every state in Brazil. The first one of them is basic sanitation. 
So basic, the lack of basic sanitation was a problem in both sides at different levels for each one of its, uh, for, uh, its components. So none of them have a safe water supply. Uh, none of them have sewage collection and safe destination into technical terms. Waste collection and safe destination is not working either. And there is no runoff control, neither for the city or for the uh, river, for the estuary. And there is also a lot of uh, circumstances where the use of space and the overload or elimination of ecosystem services is happening. So in different degrees, both sides showed these issues as main as the main issues. So I promised I was going I wasn't going to talk about marine debris, but um, I couldn't resist. So this is a relatively common situation. This is um, Boa Viagem Beach and with this sort of behavior there is no management that will ever work here because there is um, a number of events on the beach. There was um, until March. There was a number of events on the beach that generated an enormous amount of waste. And this enormous amount of waste could hardly be absorbed by the municipal service. So we had now um, just over six months of, uh, let's call it a truce from waste generation. So hopefully uh, all the research we have done on, on, on solid wastes, on plastics, on marine debris, on these sites will now help to reestablish uh, what can be done to avoid this sort of situation and other situations that uh, don't, don't involve so much glass. We, we see a lot of glass on, on the picture but especially not so much plastic. So we are hoping that um, when we go back to the beach on, on a full scale, like uh, in Boa Viagem, that uh, waste management could be uh, looked into another way that both by the public and by the public administration to avoid this sort of um, condition. So on, on a normal Sunday, we have very little space here. So we have also have very little space for any service, any municipal service to, to happen. Um, and this is another condition that should not return because if it returns, we will going back to a normal that was not um, satisfactory in terms of bringing this environment to that minimum level of conservation that we were talking about. So we might not be like a Monday, but we will have to find the middle way between these two situations. The other problem with space was that um, the city grew on the beach. So uh, building advanced on the beach. So in many places, we still have some uh, fairly well preserved um, beach and vegetation and some dunes in other places, not so much. And in other places, not at all. So this is another um, approach with uh, space that will need to be dealt with especially in areas where we still have some um, environmental services to be um, to be used. So both places during all these years of study presented some resilience. And I, I bought this picture here for you because um, these species of mollusk um, is a species that showed an incredible resilience to overfishing. So the stocks are depleted 
but in in years when they, they are not so fished um, we do observe some replenishment of the stocks the the, the method of collection allows some matrices to stay in the environment and rebuild these stocks. So despite uh, these being the species that inspired the formation of the reserve, um, other species have been added. Because of this one, has guaranteed the protection of that area. So they uh, are my resilience theories. And we do actually have uh, families uh, that has that have relied on this uh, resource for generations. They are still fished uh, with very primitive tools. It's almost a prehistoric um, activity that we still see that they do it in the same way. But the number of people is the problem. The frequency they have to assess the resource is the problem because they, now they have to transform this resource not into food but into money. So the establishment of a maximum uh, allowed yield for each group or for each family is urgent because these families are not resilient. They are not nearly as strong as the mollusks that they are fishing. So these are families in a highly vulnerable condition. And these uh, are actually the, the, the resources, the human resources is, is the actual resource that we have to rescue in this uh, extractive reserve. They must be instructed and in, they must be uh, brought into the system to tell us what they do, to tell us what they need. So we can include their needs and their demands into the equation. So when we solve the equation, the result will consider how much they need to survive not in terms of a uh, protein source, animal protein source, but also in terms of how much uh, resource, financial resource they need to generate from it, considering that they cannot kill the stock, obviously. So the number of people involved will have to be controlled, especially those who are not native from the reserve. Finally, um, the question of restoration was uh, briefly discussed in, for both environments, for the reserve in terms of improving water quality and improving um, the management of the access to the resource. And for Boa Viagem Beach here in Recife, restoration was discussed in terms of what can we do to re-establish some of the most important um, environmental services of this beach, which is to regulate um, climate in, in this area of town, that to offer um, marine environment to be there like an example for use, for sustainable use, for contemplation, for leisure, and also to protect the coast because these, this part of the beach that you see on the picture is a buffer against um, events that can actually uh, start to, to, to threaten patrimony. So other parts of this beach, if this is a 16 kilometers long um, uh, coastal coastline of this uh, continuous beach. So this is the best preserved part where the distance from the occupation is actually reasonable. In other parts, there are groins. In other parts, there was uh, beach nourishment. So 
in order for this half of the beach that is still in reasonable conditions not to go through what the other half has gone, we have to think about measures of restoration. So this is it. Thank you very much for your time and for your patience to wait for me to come back from the power cut. Thanks, Monica. Nice presentation. And very interesting. Uh, I can see some things that are happening here in Fortaleza as well. We have same issues. So uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers for nice presentations. Thank you all very much. Now we will have some time uh, for questions and discussions. Praise uh, Jim. So, hey, welcome, Nanjing. We have some questions. Uh, first, I'd like to ask Federica, uh, how can coastal erosion affect connectivity? I mean, you have showed some pictures of coastal structures like uh, seawalls. Uh, we have a lot of interventions like that in Fortaleza. So I'd like to understand better how coastal erosion could affect the disconnection that you presented. Yeah, I think that the coast erosion works like an habitat fragmentation. So maybe they change the community composition of the species living in the habitat and probably they can affect the connectivity of these species and of the communities. So decreasing maybe the possibility to connect individuals from one side to the other side or still changing the the wave of connection or uh, uh, spread of uh, larvae for some of the species that live on that. So I think that is working more or less like a, a habitat fragmentation that we observed in all the part of the world. Mm -hmm. Nice. Because we, we are under uh, a very severe coastal erosion here. And there are a lot of structures and interventions, interventions like beach nourishment. So that's interesting to know. I mean, you don't know why uh, they took the beach to the sand. So maybe they put some other species so that also you can increase the, the spread of non indigenous species from the ground to feed uh -huh. the change of the, the habitat and the, of the environment. And that can affect all the population and all the species that live there. Yes, the most interesting thing is that everybody talked about uh, different things with different backgrounds, but all the paths led to the same point: it's management. So that's the real issue, and apparently we have the same issue at everywhere. Yes. So I'm, I have a question. I have a question about it. But I will, uh, I will talk. I will ask you later. Okay. Uh, Sergio has a question to Lanjin. So, Lanjin, Sergio asked you if do these dams they affect uh, on coastal productivity, productivity, because he thinks that there is a, a huge plan to increase the numbers of dams in Amazonia. Well, about the dams, we have a lot of dams here in the northeast of Brazil because we need them due to the, the drought seasons. So we have a lot of, uh, have many dams in the Sierra. Uh, yes, uh, look, we have to consider from uh, different aspects. Uh, when we talk about sand, uh, on the, because uh, nutrients usually come with fine grained sediments. The nutrients are associated with fine grained sediments. So when you build a dam, you almost immediately cut 
of the supply of uh, fine grain sediment to the coast. But sand is different because uh, in the lower river course, there is a lot of sand. And uh, this sand uh, uh, is not mobilized. It does not reach the, the, the river mouth because there is no discharge. When you regulate the discharge, you and you in and, and you you cut the peak discharge, so it affects what you call backwater length of a river. The backwater length is the lower portion of the river where the surface of the river flow is parallel to the river bed. As you approach the river mouth, both diverge, and this causes sediment accumulation. So during normal flow, you usually have sediment accumulation in the backwater length of a river, which can extend tens of kilometers uh, up, up, up uh, uh, from the river mouth. Okay. So when you cut the, the big discharge, you 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 do not have how to mobilize the sediment and and bring the sediment to the river mouth. So. When you build a, a, a dam, the signal of uh, interruption of, of uh, sediment to the river mouth, it takes some decades until it reaches the river mouth because we have a, a large stock of, of sediment below river course. That's why when, when I'm talking about the San Francisco River, the coast of Rose is not because sediment is retained is trapped in the in the dams is because there is no more flow to discharge this the, the, the existing sediment the lower river, river course to the river mouth also the, the if you look at the the coast erosion the, the san francisco it began before some of the river the, the dams were be constructed uh, I, I i finished writing a paper that shows this very nicely but uh, concerning the nutrients is another thing, because uh, since it comes from suspension, as soon as you have a, a, a lot of dense bits along the river course, you, you almost initially cut the, the, the supply of fine grain sediment to the river mouth. So uh, Sagers writes, uh, dams, they, they considerably reduce uh, fine grain sediment supply to the river mouth, but not necessarily sand, because uh, sand, there's a lot of sand uh, uh, in, in the lower river course of most rivers. For example, in Mississippi, there are work that has been done in Mississippi that shows that the amount of sand in the lower Mississippi River can provide sediment to the river mouth for more than two centuries ahead. But the fine grain sediment, which is important for some deltas, this is, is really uh, trapped in the measure dam. Nice, nice. Uh, I'd like to, to ask uh, Lorenzo. Lorenzo, uh, Sasha also have a question for you. So, do you think long time ago the red coral was a dominant ecosystem engineer, uh, even in shallow areas? So, um, yes, and, and it's not something that I think, but it's something that we know, because uh, we know that uh, just uh, um, at the time of uh, two or three generations before, was uh, our grandfathers and the fathers of our grandfather were speaking in where were they living in the places where the red coral was common was speaking about huge population of red coral and then there's something that uh, th there's a, a paint an ancient painting that Federica sometimes shows in a presentation and uh, there is uh, is ancient in the 18th century 17th century in which they are represented uh, fishermen that take uh, th there is this paint with big red coral colonies upside down, so uh, um, upside, not now, now, not like like now they are in crevices, 
and these uh, people goes without uh, uh, breathing, so in apnea, in free diving. That means that it was most common and it was present at uh, less depth. So it's something that we know by effect that was uh, more common, more uh, widespread, and that uh, a, a role of the ecosystem engineer because colonies were 10 times great. great. I see. So uh, I have a question for you, Monica. I like a lot of your presentation. Uh, it's because I have been thinking a lot about uh, marine pollution during the pandemic. So I live across from the beach, so I have, I have this question. Do you think that the pandemic has affected, in a good way, the beaches, especially reducing the debris on the beaches? Because during the pandemic, there were uh, less people on beaches. So if, if there are less, if there are less people, so many uh, less debris they throw at the beach. It's true for for the for the, the for the trash uh -huh. for the rubbish that is generated by the beach user. It is true. Uh, there was almost no generation when when the beaches were closed. Now people start to 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 the people restarted their old habits. This is um, what I say about this. We are at the point of breaking with bad old habits. This is the time. If we don't do it now, we won't do it. We will carry on doing all the stupid things we did before. So uh, Salvador is doing a very good job on it. Uh, Salvador is, is working hard to fight the bad habits that we had before. I don't know if HCP is doing so well, uh, but it is possible that uh, people themselves will, will start to see the beach not as a place to leave um, their rubbish, the things that they generated when they used the beach. That's, that it, that's reduced very much. But this is not the only source of uh, waste for a beach. There are other sources that did not stop. So, for instance, urban runoff and marine sources. It is very funny. When we think about the beach, we think only about the, the sand package, the place where we put our tower and sit down. The beach is not only that. There is at least half of it that is submerged, and we are not seeing it. In the case of Recife, in the case of many other beaches on, on the Brazilian Northeast, we have uh, an environment that, that is very rich, environmentally speaking, because there are um, beach rocks, there are reefs, there's, there's a lot of life very close to the shore. So this part is not being observed. We don't know what happened there. But we are sure that um, there is also something happening there. For instance, it is not being so affected by the beach user source that we had before. But we might have some other sources acting now. And the other thing is um, we, we did not measure these changes. These changes were not quantified, only at some places. So we don't know uh, if, um, for instance, the, the quantity or the quality has changed. We have reports of many places around the world where items related to, to the pandemic are being found ashore. Uh, like masks and gloves and uh, caps and that um, shoe cap that people are using, and they are discardable. We see them on the street, we see them a lot. We see even items that are not just single uh, use. We see, we see the recyclable masks on, on, on the floor of the cities. So uh, we are now uh, just waiting 
the opportunity to observe if everything that is on the on, on the ground around the city will eventually come ashore will be found on the beach as well so there, there was a change in, um, in quantity but there is also a change in quality and it is now the time to 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 try to interrupt some fluxes and try to know and control others. The beach management um, is on is on a is on an important turning point now because water quality and solid waste are the two main points that are brought up by the public when they talk about beach management. They they think that being able to go into the water and being able to sit on the sand and to enjoy it with your children, with your friends and family are the two main points. And this is quite true. If we could control water quality and the amount of rubbish and oh, trash, whatever, on the sand, the quality of the beach would give a jump forward. Um, the, the, the pandemic is, is a time of reflection, the pandemic is a time of discussion, so we will find out what we don't want anymore. That's, that's the whole point. So it is true, but we have to be careful what we are going to do now. Okay, okay. That's it. Actually, I always talk to my students about the importance of management because uh, coastal planners and uh, majors of small cities and big cities as well, they, and even population, they don't have, they don't know very much coasts and marine environments. And all of you have showed some problems uh, from the coasts to marine environments. And I'm going to ask to any of you who wants to answer this. What is the greatest challenge to reach um, society in general to take a look at the sea? Because I, I see this, this discussion since I was in college uh, 2003, 2001, almost 20 years ago. And I, I, I don't see things, uh, a movement for coastal managers to deal with the, the problems, I mean, to resolve them. And the question is, what is the, the greatest challenge to, to coastal managers to deal with uh, several issues that you presented? I think if I can, if I can start with giving my, my opinion on this, I think that uh, the, the the challenge is uh, reaching the consensus of the people, the support of the population. Because I have an example that is uh, Livorno is a small town in Tuscany where coral is abundant and was uh, harvested historically, but that for a lot of time was not harvested, and the population started, the local population started to uh, like his coral and go visiting it, do diving, a commercial diving uh, developed around this uh, precious uh, wall of uh, red coral. And uh, some years ago, a couple of years ago, a, a, fisherman, a coral fisherman with a license coming from Spain, if, I, if I'm not wrong, started to work on Livorno because it was legal. These people called me and say, oh, there's someone harvesting coral. They say, if it has a license, it has controlled, etc." It has the right to do that. Local people, which less than 50 years ago were uh, coral fishermen themselves, started to attack these fishermen, um, wanting to give fire with, uh, to his boat and saying that they, he does not have to touch their coral because they want to see it and uh, bring it. So the, the, the protection was coming from there. And then they asked to the local management to apply the FAO rule of the banning of fishery of 50 meters depth. And the local managers had to 
apply a protection to avoid riots in the in the village. So this is the way in which probably when you when you are able to do this and okay it's simple for a charismatic species like that but the, the way is that to having the, the, the support of the population is the most difficult thing because they're very easy um, uh, way of thinking on the other side that they say okay but yes the economy is important no 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 there's non consumptive utilization of the resources an example so I think that the, 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 the deal is that because when you have the support of the people, then it's more easy to pass the, the, the law, the management. We see with the marine protected area. If we are people against, it's almost impossible and not working. Local people have to be involved and uh, conquered in some way. Okay. Okay, thanks. I also that, uh, yes, I also think that uh, I agree with Lorenzo, but uh, I also think that uh, you say that uh, you are in the university for a, a lot of times, but I think that we are now in that generation that can go to the government to manage the, the environment. And so I think that we are starting now to have in that position that we can make a change on, on this. So. I, I see in that direction some optimist. From the other point of view, maybe not, but for the for the understanding of the importance of the ocean, the use that we we, we do of uh, the ocean, I think that we are starting now to to reach the level that we can do some kind of difference. Thanks. Yes, Monica. I, I think the big challenge is that we we need to start looking at management as a large experiment, as a real experiment. So we, we cannot... Uh, Lorenzo was very happy uh, with, in his talk when he said that uh, for many things in life, we do things correctly. But for others, we are completely mad. So management is one of them that we, we, don't, we don't think about planning what we are going to do. So typically, uh, people do things and just to see if it works. And usually it doesn't. So this is, uh, I live in Recife and I live in the middle of this sediment started post that Landin was talking about. The, the, the ridiculous, the absurd things that we see are, uh, along the coast here, building defenses that will obviously not work just because they, they want to save one house, they compromise the whole environment. So um, we need to see coastal management, we need to see intervention as experiments that need previous observation, the formulation of a possible solution, the application of this solution and its assessment. If we don't do it, we are not going anywhere. We are going to continue destroying our coastlines and we will have the help of climate change, of global change and sea level rise and we, we are gonna be in very deep trouble. Okay, hey, thanks. Do you want to talk, Lanjing, please? Just to, to complement what Monica says, uh, we are facing uh, a rising level of maybe more than a meter. Today, the, the, the global temperatures are about to one degree more than in pre-industrial times. And last time the, the earth was one degree warmer uh, was 120,000 years ago, the last interglacial. And this level rose more than six meters above present level. So if the level rises one meter or a little bit more, there is no cost of management that we can deal with that. So that's the, the, the major threats <laughs> that uh, we face. 
global warming, climate change. Well, the, the greatest challenge now is to adapt to the to the scenarios. So nice. Uh, thank you all for your for your answers. We have a lot of questions. A lot of people congratulated you all, and uh, we are on time. But I think we can make some questions. Uh, just a second. Uh, Federica, it seems that coral reef distribution may be moving poleward due to climate change. Would the dispersion of the larvae be fast enough to cope uh, this warming problem? That you host, yes. uh, I don't think so, but uh, also depending on the, the species, but uh, it's hard. But you talk about uh, adaptation. I don't know if the the species, or, or, or at least all the species of the coral species can adapt moving with larvae to the north. I don't know. We'll see what happens. <laughs> okay. Lorenzo, another for you. Uh, do you have the tools to make proper benthic transplantation plan at a large scale? Can we upscale to as the European Union wants? I mean, uh, this is the should be the objective, and uh, as I told you, should, we should start uh, step by step. But I think that, for example, if we apply the, um, uh, of course, with transplantation, it's not possible to go large scale because uh, it's uh, it's not not feasible. Possibly um, increasing the, the, the probability of a settlement and uh, using the sexual restoration a larger scale. As long as we don't start from the hypothesis and the discovering of the mechanism, it's another way of sending seeds and see what happens. But I think that uh, to go higher scale, to a higher scale, uh, we don't have to think. I speak for for what I for, for my topic. So for the restoration of the of corals, let's say in general. So I think that the way is the um, eventually is the sexual repro using sexual reproduction. And uh, yes, there can be the tools to go higher scale, but they have to be based on uh, sound scientific data. If not, we we are again on the on the trials. But it's time to to try to go higher scale. Okay, uh, so we have time for some questions. Uh, Talita has made some questions to, to three of you. Federica, is there any hope that the methods showed in your presentation could be incorporated by some legal act actors or legislation of environmental monitoring? Yeah, I think so. I think that there are some places where this uh, at local scale management at local scale then already put uh, connectivity within uh, the uh, decree and uh, and law. So I think that yes, I think that is uh, is possible and it's doable. And uh, there are uh, some places where there are already into management uh, connectivity. Thanks. Thanks. And Lorenzo, uh, I'd like to know, Talita asks, uh, she'd like to know if the project consider using beneficial microorganisms in the facilitation of the restoration project. Huh. So it is something, uh, it's, new, it's quite new to me, this uh, beneficial organism and uh, the, 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 this, uh, this topic. And it's something I spoke with a colleague recently um, just uh, uh, coupled with the experiment of uh, electroaccretion, there was a, um, a plan to try to study these beneficial organisms. But at the moment, I know that are, they are used for other, uh, there's this line of research for other corals for the um, restoration. But uh, for me, it's a new thing that is in, uh, in, in, the, next, uh, in the next thing to do. I, I recently, just uh, less than one year ago, it was uh, b before before the lockdown. Uh, I was starting to to speak about uh, doing some experiment on that. So definitely, it could be interesting. Yes, thanks. 
Uh, Monica, Claudia Marçal has a question for you. In your study, it was verified that verified the overlapping of competences in the organization of coastal territory, beach and shore, by public institutions. And what is your perception about this? The overlapping of, of um, like institutions that manage the same territory. Is that the question? Uh, the, the overlapping competences in organization uh, in the coastal territory, I mean, uh, in beaches and shores by public institutions. Uh, it, what's, your, uh, what's your perception about this? How do you see this overlap of competences? I, I suppose competences hardly ever overlap. What overlaps is um, their, their misreading of their competences because most of the institutions have for a mission to, um, to reduce conflict in the territories they have to manage. So one way of reducing conflict is dialoguing, is sitting down around the table and talking about the issues that are uh, developing that territory. So in the case of the extractive reserve, this, this category of marine protected area, it uh, has a council. And this council is one of the, 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 one of the best thought alternatives in our uh, protection, uh, Environmental Protection Act, the, what we call SNOOC. Um, mm -hmm. Because this council, they can deliberate they are not only to be consulted, they, they can actually choose what is going to happen in that territory. And that council, it includes all, all the stakeholders. So there is a, there is a very interesting combination of re represent, representatives. So in the case of the extractive reserve, uh, leadership is the issue in that council. In the case of the beach here in Recife, uh, as I said, in the last 20 years since we started to study the environment, there were very important changes. The year of 2015, for example, uh, was the year when the federal government decided to share in a more effective way beach management with the municipal power. So this is a time when we have to look into these new instruments and try to put them uh, to work, try to implement them in a way that there is the reduction of the conflict. So this overlapping, it has to be discussed because when, when you identify that two institutions have uh, similar competences, they have to redivide these competences to optimize resources and possibly to arrange that territory in a way that they are not into conflict, but into complementation of their action, of their management, of their potentials. So I see as a problem that has a solution. But people need to want to look for that solution. And that is one of the uh, next that we, we are facing now. Mm -hmm. Monica, one, one more question for you. This is from Habindra Maiti. Uh, Monica, how to control microplastic in motion in future aspect, in your opinion? I mean, how, how to control the... the the microplastic issue in the ocean. The microplastic issue is um, we microplastics are a very pervasive form of pollution, but they are a form of pollution. And in the last 
almost 100 years, we have learned a lot about how to control pollution. And the main learning is that we have to control the sources. It is very difficult to control environmental factors, but the sources we can try to control. So there are mainly two sources of microplastics to the ocean. One is the primary sources, when the microplastics arrive to the ocean in, in the size they already are observed. So a lot has been done in terms of control of pellets, for instance. We still have a lot to do in terms of control of fibers. But in the case of secondary microplastics, we have to control the source of large plastics that will break down into microplastics when they are exposed to environmental conditions. So whatever type of pollution you ask me, it can be metals, it can be organics, it can be um, nutrients, it can be plastics, it can be radioactivity, sound, light, whatever marine pollution we are talking about, what we have to work on is control of the sources. If you don't control the sources, you will be like, um, I don't know the, 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 how to say in English, uh, you will be drying ice all the time. This is what you are going to do. So control the sources, consume less, rethink what you were buying. You don't need everything you have. Just reduce your consumption, yours and everybody else, obviously, so you can scale up this, this type of solution. Nice. Thanks. So, Landin, uh, I have a question for you, and I, I do agree with everything that you said about uh, climate change, and you have a lot of issues to adapt. It's difficult to manage coastal resources, so adapt seems to be very far from our reality, especially because it's very expensive to do that. Uh, in Brazil, we have a limitation of data that we don't have many uh, uh, a long term of monitoring data. So, what techniques we could use to work with the uh, with scenarios of uh, a sea level rise? Uh, uh, I don't understand what you mean exactly. Uh... What kind of scenario, you mean the impacts of uh, the sea level rise? Uh -huh. Well, we, do, we don't have many data available. I mean, of long terms, of many years of monitoring. And what kind of, what, what techniques we could use to analyze the impacts of no. sea level rise? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. actually we have uh, data from tidal gauges. Uh -huh. And also have uh, data from satellites that measures how much the level is rising. But uh, uh, the implication is not only the implications of sea level rise. Climate changes uh, will impact the amount of rainfall, for example, in the drainage basins. Mm -hmm. And uh, most ba the, the basins that will be be more severely affected are the Amazon and the Northeast. So uh, San Francisco, Amazon, Parnaíba basins will be severely affected. In fact, uh, uh, during the last uh, 50 years, rainfall in the San Francisco basin has decreased almost 30%. So uh, it's not only river regulation that's causing all this problem of mm -hmm. erosion. So, but uh, uh, climate change will impact position of sea level and this uh, will result in uh, in uh, inundation of uh, uh, low-lying areas. And uh, one way to predict those impacts, you have to have a uh, uh, numerical elevation models 
if you have numerical elevation models, uh, uh, especially using LIDAR, that you can have accuracy of uh, decimeters, centimeters, uh, you can uh, uh, use different scenarios of sea level rising. For example, if sea level rises 50 centimeters, what's the area that will be flooded with this, this rise? In order to model this, you have to have this digital elevation models uh, uh, with this kind of accuracy of a few few centimeters to decimeters. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have that in Brazil. It would, would be nice to have this for, for most of those metropolitan areas so you can predict with uh, uh, accuracy how, how much uh, what's the percentage of a urban area that will be affected by by uh, uh, sea level or just level rise, not the other implications of climate change? Because with climate change, we have a rising temperature, we have acidification that affects all marine life, the temperature affects all the marine life. And uh, uh, what people say is, for example, the uh, United States is investing a lot of money to raise the infrastructure of Miami, but uh, we may reach a point that uh, does not compensate to invest billions of billions of dollars in order to protect Miami, and maybe Miami has to be abandoned. And this might happen with all our coastal cities, especially for us that uh, are vulnerable. We don't have means to uh, to to go and start doing beach nourishment or even protect it with hard structures. So if, if sea level rise it's <clears throat> reach more than one, two meters, we eventually have to abandon uh, some of those coastal areas. Because we don't have we don't have money to to protect those all those areas. And and uh, in, in this aspect I compliment Salvador is a is a is a smart city is a, is is a vulnerability to level rise is almost new because uh, of the high relief. If the level rise is to meet it, it may be you 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 eliminate all urban beaches, but uh, the 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 area of the city that to be flooded is minimum compared, for example, to Recife or Rio de Janeiro. Yeah, so maybe a lot of people will migrate to Salvador. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> so, uh, hey guys, I'd like to to congratulate and I'm thankful for your speech. It was very rich. It was very nice. All of us, we learned a lot. Thank you very much for being here. And I'd like to thank to the audience for staying with us until now. I know it's almost 11 p.m. in Europe, in India. So it's uh, almost 6 p.m. in Brazil. Thank you very much for staying with us. Thank you for your kind attention. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Nice to meet all of you. Thank Likewise. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.